And now I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Catherine Flegel, who will be joining us also by Zoom here. Uh, Dr. Flegel is a consulting professor at Stanford University. She was formerly a senior scientist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Center for Health Statistics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Flegel. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not going to talk about culture at all. I do have a bachelor's degree in anthropology, so I do kind of know about this, but I'm going to talk about a completely different uh, kind of topic about how BMI categories came to be, the drive for reimbursement, the role of the drug companies, briefly, for all these important issues. And uh, people know this already, but just to remind you how big a deal weight loss actually is in this country. Um, these are the data from Haynes on adults trying to lose weight among, um, and you see that uh, not only are a large number of people who are obese trying to lose weight, in fact, a lot of people who are normal weight, particularly women, are also trying to lose weight. So this is a, a massive phenomenon. And But according to the Institute of Medicine, <laughs> Uh, prior to the late 20th century, overweight and obesity were not considered a population-wide health risk. That might be an odd statement, but in their 2012 report, basically they go through this. People did not think particularly of overweight and obesity being that uh, important. It was a cosmetic issue, not a health issue. Uh, health insurance didn't cover weight loss treatments. Weight loss treatment was not considered a medical deduction. And part of this was because related to the fact that weight loss drugs were pretty ineffective and had a, a rather checkered history uh, causing problems, being withdrawn, not working that well, and so on. So what changed? Well, the big change of what happened in the late 20th century was that uh, the idea of prescription weight loss drugs for long term began, first with FenFen in 1992, then Redux, dexfenfluramine uh, came on the market in 1995 and took off incredibly, like uh, people were writing 85,000 prescriptions a week. And then when securities analysts projected it would hit a billion dollars in sales in five years. However, it turned out to cause some real problems and it was withdrawn in 1997. Another drug, Meridia, with Sibutramine was approved in 1997 also and was also withdrawn in 2010. Xenical, Borlistat was approved by FDA in 1999. So, and there were other drugs that um, were being considered and developed, and as you know, very uh, recently, very uh, much more powerful weight loss drugs have been created. And a Roche spokesman uh, put this out clearly that part of the challenge in selling these drugs was to medicalize weight management uh, for physicians. So here's a, an article by Jacques Peretti uh, in The Guardian. Put it very clearly, by the 1990s, food companies and the pharmaceutical industry realized there was a huge amount of money to be made. And this article describes as a key turning point, uh, this, the, an expert cons consultation in Geneva on obesity and it formed the basis for a report that it had really the whole message of this uh, report was conveyed in the title that obesity, what obesity was one of the words, and the other one was epidemic. So this really put uh, the obesity epidemic front and center and um, conveyed this message very clearly. Here's, a, uh, but WHO already had a report about use of anthropometry that they had published in 1995. This was a very elaborate 400-page uh, book. It was several years in the making of, of uh, the, getting all the, the people writing their chapters and so on. It covered all these topics in pregnant women, infants, children, adults, thin adults, fat adults, stunning thinness, but there was no definition of obesity in terms of body fat. And there was also no definition of obesity in terms of what kind of BMI level. So this really, from the point of view of a BMI category for obesity, didn't provide anything. What they did was, in this 1995 report, they, they defined three degrees of overweight. And they chose 
cut points of 25, 30, and 40 for BMI. Now, where do they get these cut points from? They themselves say they were largely arbitrary. And they comment about a BMI of 30 as being the point at which risk begins to increase but they don't provide any reference for that statement. So you don't really know what they were working with. And then they also provided a, a fairly common kind of definition of obesity is so fat storage associated with elevated health risks. Well, that sounds good, but how much fat are we talking about? Well, we don't really know. And that's kind of still true today. There's not really a consensus about what level of fat this might be. There are some numbers that are commonly used and I tried to look into this and you really can't find any reference for these actual numbers. And in fact, they vary very widely. And, and as you might know, also measuring fat itself also can be somewhat variable depending on your method you're using. So there's kind of, it's a some kind of degree of fat storage that will have some relation with health. We don't really know what that is. And then they also set out that there are no cutoff points. First of all, we don't know how much fat mass we're talking about anyway. And there's no way to translate any cutoff points into BMI. So we end up without a real definition of obesity. And we don't have a BMI definition of obesity at this stage. Then the International Obesity Task Force, the IOTF, was formed in 1995 just when this other report came out. And the point of the IOTF was to have a special consultation at WHO that would be solely devoted to obesity. And they had a mission to inform the world's governments about the urgency of the obesity problem and persuade them that the time to act was now. So this might be almost viewed somewhat as a, as a lobbying group because they want to influence government actions. They, a lot of people have the impression that the, the IOTF was part of WHO, but it was a standalone entity. It was just created by itself. It didn't have any reference to any other group. And it, it was fairly large. It had, um, it, it had members from different countries who are obesity experts. It also had uh, full-time staff. So there, was, uh, there were quite a few people involved. But... Um, at first, WHO, so the IOTF's mission was to get WHO to have a consultation on obesity. But WHO didn't really want to do that. They didn't have it in their program. It, hadn't been, it wasn't part of their plans. It hadn't been approved by their executive committee. But the IOTF gave them money to fund the consultation. And the IOTF staff basically wrote the draft report, which was adopted with almost any, no changes at all. And WHO decided to publish this report and took an unusual step of disseminating an interim copy. Again, the IOTF paid to have free copies of this report um, sent to health ministers of all UN countries and to any others who requested it. I myself got, never requested any copies of this report and I have two of them. So it was really it was disseminated very widely by the IOTF. So, where did the IOTF get their money to do all these things? Well, they were funded by drug companies. And although I have a reference here, and this is a quote from the chair, says the people who funded the IOTF were drug companies. How much, the reporter asked, how much were you paid? He said, they used to give me checks of about 200,000 British pounds at a time. And I think I had a million or more, again, British pounds. This is about the equivalent of 2.5 million US dollars today. So this is a, a, a pretty good funding level and how they were able presumably to do all these things. And here's a picture of the interim report. Again, it has the, the word obesity, preventing and managing the global epidemic. Really all you need is the title to see what this is going to be about. It's not that interesting a report. And this is the the interim report that was published by the IOTF that's different from the final report, which came out in a, a more, somewhat more bureaucratic form, but essentially the same text. So this report unexpectedly modified the terminology for BMI categories. In the 1995 report, there were these three grades of overweight, all defined by BMI, and there was a normal range. 
And in the 1997 consultation, they say, well, we have a classification which is in agreement with the 1995 report, but it's not exactly the same. It, it has dropped this word overweight for this purpose, and it's introduced the word obesity. And this is a very important distinction because overweight is, is not, doesn't have the same medical or, or emotional meaning as the word obesity. And now, and the, and the 1995 report, there was no real definition of obesity at all. Now we have one. And there is a, a concurrent activity going on in the United States. A committee from NIH was working on new clinical guidelines for overweight and obesity. And there was quite a bit of overlap between the IOTF and this committee. The chair of the NIH committee and uh, three other members were all members of the IOTF. And now this report came out in 1998, concurrent with the publication of the interim report. Uh, the new guidelines had new classifications that were based on the interim report from the WHO consultation. So these, this, these categories came into being at that moment. And they changed the definition a little bit more. So now we have the ones we mostly use today, certainly in the US and many other places, where we have normal BMI, overweight is a BMI of 25 to 30. At 30, it changes to obese and we have severe obesity. Now there's no data that really support these changes in terminology. There was nothing that happened. They have the same thing in both the 97 report and 1998 committee report, which is that this is the 30 is the point at which risk begins to rise. But again, neither of those have any actual definition or, or, or citation as why they're saying this and what do they mean by it. But this is an extremely important change. And a lot of people got upset by this. Um, a committee member, they, um, express concern about we're opening the door for widespread use of drugs, stigmatizing people. Similarly, uh, former Surgeon General Coop didn't like the idea that the panel had broadened the definition of overweight, says it's gonna confuse the public. It stigmatizes millions of Americans and lacks a solid scientific rationale. And this really upset me because I was working for the US government and we started to put out our, our estimates and we use the word obesity and we use these categories. And I was really unnerved myself when I read this in the New York Times. They described the cut points as providing the pharmaceutical industry with a, a booming new market for diet pills for the obese practically served to the companies on a silver platter by the government. And I was, that kind of began to open my eyes. Wait a minute, why is this happening? And I realized that we had, started publishing obesity prevalence reports and saying that these people had this condition, but had never been diagnosed by anybody. There's no medical intervention necessarily. It's just, we have height and weight data. Now we can calculate all these numbers, but it's not really a medical uh, you know, category. And as part of what was going on here, also that reimbursement became a huge issue in the obesity research world. And reimbursement is the idea that there should be some provision of medical providers to be reimbursed for obesity. And this is part of the Roche um, attempt to medicalize weight management to physicians. But there were some barriers. A uh, major barrier was that the US medical coverage manual stated bluntly, that obesity itself cannot be considered an illness and you can't pay for it um, under your medical insurance. So this was a, an issue that kept uh, rising. But these barriers to reimbursement started to fall. In 2001, there was a member of IOTF who joined CDC, organized and chaired a um, group there called Including Obesity Treatment and Benefit Plans on the topic of reimbursement of healthcare providers for obesity treatment. And because of this meeting, after the discussion of this meeting, which included government employees and some kind of various consultants and um, others, and an insurance company provider, they put in a rec uh, request, CDC put in a request to remove the Medicare language, which stated that obesity is not an illness. So that felt, made that barrier fall. And then in 2013, 
AMA recognized obesity as a disease. This was a complicated topic and, and there's a lot, a lot of discussion on it. The AMA's Council on Science and Public Health will recommend against this, but the full group decided to accept this. So now we have a situation where insurance companies can pay for obesity. It's a medical condition and you can prescribe medicine for it. And there were also the same thing in European guidelines. But so this is, so I guess what I'm trying to say here, sorry, I'm, is this that the, there's not much basis for these actual definitions. They kind of came out of almost nowhere. And the, you know, in, in 1995, you wouldn't really have used this definition of obesity, but just a few years later, this became a very important and uh, wide, very widely used definition. But I think there are some new directions that are uh, starting to be used because people are starting, have started to realize the, the problems with BMI. I, have a, I save these articles. There's about 20 articles, I think, that in their title say the words beyond BMI. This shows that there's a sense that, that we need to do something different, something more, something's wrong here. Something about BMI is not really working that well for us. So I would just like to mention briefly these two um, articles. One is from um, Ozzy Westphal and Miller about the diagnosis of obesity based on body composition. And they're calling for a change in what they call the paradigm. Say, if you just think that obesity is over fat, that doesn't really help you really understand what the health risks are. And they say it's time to call the adipo adipo adipocentric paradigm of obesity into question and avoid the use of BMI and body fat percentage. They're actually taking a very different perspective here where we don't use BMI, we don't use body fat. We have a, a very different approach. And they look at this in the question of limited fat mass and muscle mass and capacity for fat storage and want to use this, um, this approach, really get rid of this whole situation, maybe keep the word obesity, I'm not quite sure why in this case, but to, to get away for it and talk about lean mass. They may not make the point that lean mass may be more important and that at older ages, when people tend to be have higher BMIs, that may be an advantage because they have more lean mass. So this is a whole new way of thinking about it. And there's another thing that just came out last week from the Lancet, I think, or very recently anyway, on the definition and diagnosis of clinical obesity. Donna probably knows all about this actually, but um, so what they say is very interesting. They, they get back to the point that I was trying to make before is that there's no really, uh, no real BMI definition that's, that's based on any clear uh, research exactly. And they put, this group points out that we started to use BMI as predictor of of future disease or mortality, not as a measure of an illness. So when we publish these articles saying that this is the prevalence of this disease, obesity, well, we don't have any idea that these, these people have an illness. They're just, they just have this BMI over 30. And so they say that the attribution of disease status to obesity defined exclusively by a BMI threshold is intrinsically flawed. This is not a good way to approach these issues. And they also, the reimbursement issue comes up again, but sort of an unexpected way, I think, with the, the, especially with the new drugs that have just come out, that how can you afford this? Because in terms of um, the definitions, we have a normal weight definition in terms of BMI. And about 50% of people, why is this the normal definition? Because in even European countries, at least half the people in almost all populations are over the normal weight. So, so why, is this, why is this low number the normal uh, con condition? Is it really normal? And so this, this got pushed down, but now that means in effect that obesity as a disease in, involves you know, a very, very large portion of people in many, many different countries. 
And now who's going to pay for that? Now you say you have this definition of obesity is a disease and you have these drugs that might work very well for this. And suddenly are these people all supposed to be, have be disabled or eligible for expensive treatment? And as they point out, such claims would effectively make obesity a, a financially and socially intractable issue. So we've almost gone full circle where there's this great effort to, to somewhat medicalize obesity, to define it in terms of BMI. But now it turns out that we've defined so many people in terms of BMI that we can't really afford to treat them. So I think this shows that there are people starting to think about different ways to look at this. And this, this Lancet thing is very interesting because what they want to do is develop a way to define obesity clinical, clinically, not as the condition of just having a BMI over 30, but to associate it with some kind of definition that could be actually arrived at by clinical examination. Because right now, we don't really need a clinical examination to define obesity because it's just weight and height. You can measure it yourself at home. And you can, you can be considered obese in our statistics without ever seeing a doctor or having any medical encounter. So I think there's, this is shows the realization that's come through is that um, there needs to be some different approach to this and find some clinical way to define obesity rather than just using these this arbitrary statistics because those statistics also don't take into account um, all the, the other, if you look at any, any um, scientific discussion of this is that in fact, the, the amount of body fat that as a health issue might vary a lot by your age, your sex, your ethnicity and so on. And this very simplistic measure that we're using now does not capture that element. Thank you.